Okay. Um, I can see you, Thomas, only at the moment. Yeah. Uh, this is Alex speaking. Okay. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Um, pleased to join you. Some people are still joining, uh, but it is past five, so uh, let us start. Uh, we are uh, very pleased um, to host uh, this webinar on assessing the state of terrorism studies uh, with such a distinguished panel uh, joining us um, today. Um, but in truth, um, this webinar is not just uh, to assess the state of terrorism studies, but we, it was also timed uh, to coincide uh, with the launch of the new issue of the journal um, perspectives on terrorism, as we're particularly thrilled to announce uh, publicly, as some of you might have already uh, heard uh, or uh, read, that Perspectives on Terrorism is now being published by ICCT, the International Center for Counterterrorism, uh, in partnership with the Institute of Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University and the HANDA Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence, known as CSTPV. Uh, at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Uh, this has been uh, a long-term, I should say, and collective effort. I still remember when I started discussing uh, this, uh, this idea, talking about the future of perspectives on terrorism uh, with Alex Schmidt, uh, who I'm very glad uh, is joining us today, uh, about a year ago. Uh, and I have to say, and to recognize that we are so honored and so privileged uh, that he trusted us enough uh, to let us continue publishing uh, what is basically uh, his uh, journal to, to a large extent. Uh, I'm also particularly grateful to all those who made this uh, transition uh, possible uh, and particularly here at ICCT, uh, particularly grateful to uh, the editorial team and to the communications team. Uh, perspectives on terrorism is, um, I think, a lot of you, uh, if not all of you, would agree, uh, a leading uh, academic journal uh, and also a great resource uh, for students, for researchers, for practitioners, and for policymakers uh, active in the field uh, of uh, counterterrorism uh, or countering violent extremism. Uh, we at ICCT, together with ISCA and CSTPV, we want to build. Uh, on and to expand uh, the journal's uh, existing uh, reputation. Uh, we want to further professionalize uh, the editorial experience uh, for uh, the reviewers, but also uh, for the readers and for the authors. Uh, we want to modernize uh, the journal's uh, design and accessibility online. Uh, all of that while uh, maintaining perspectives on terrorism as an open access uh, journal, which is truly at the heart uh, and part of its uh, identity. Uh, and you might already have uh, seen uh, a large part of it uh, if you have already visited uh, the new website of Perspectives uh, on Terrorism. And if you haven't, uh, I strongly uh, encourage you to visit the new uh, journal at uh, PT. 
www.icct.nl. Um, I think you might uh, already uh, see uh, some um, images of what the journal uh, and the PDF uh, of the journal now uh, look like, uh, and we would strongly uh, encourage you again uh, to browse the website, to browse the new issue, uh, to discover uh, all of that by yourself. Um, at the moment, uh, it is still, I should say, not a full uh, version of the website that you will be able to see online, um, as basically we're still uh, migrating all the uh, archives of the journal that you can still access from the website of uh, Leiden uh, University, but in a very short while, you'll be able to access all uh, the issues in one place uh, on the new website of Perspectives uh, on uh, Terrorism. Um, and there's also a number of uh, new features uh some of which uh basically uh were already existing uh under uh the journal in the pdf but some of which uh, would be newer that we have transitioned uh to an online environment such as basically a calendar of uh events relevant uh to the field of terrorism studies um bibliographies that have long been part of the identity uh of this uh journal but also a number of other uh, online uh, resources uh, that are particularly uh, helpful uh, for, again, researchers, practitioners, and policymakers, for instance, such as um, databases. And there's quite a lot of databases out there uh, on terrorism and counterterrorism. So all of that is quite um, is quite exciting and will be accessible in in a short in a short while. Uh, for all of us. Uh, at ICCT, uh, this is really, truly uh, uh, an achievement. We're really proud uh, to be able uh, to now publish uh, this leading journal, uh, again, in partnership with such a great team. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this truly reflects um, the core mission uh, of uh, ICCT, which is to produce and contribute uh, to cutting edge uh, research, but also to bridge uh, between different communities and notably between uh, researchers, practitioners, and policymakers in the field of counterterrorism and countering violent extremism, and also to act uh, as a sort of knowledge hub, uh, publicly accessible, uh, compiling uh, research, uh, the best research uh, on terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, We're particularly proud uh, to partner in this uh, initiative. Uh, with uh, ISCA at Leiden University and with CSTPV at the University of St. Andrews, which are basically two leading institutions in this field uh, and creating de facto a sort of a hub of excellence in the field of terrorism studies through this uh, sort of flagship product, but perhaps more initiatives could uh, step out of this uh, out of this partnership. We have established um, a new editorial team uh, that is of, uh, it uh, goes without saying, uh, of exceptional uh, quality and which is basically represented uh, on this panel. And I will introduce uh, all of them uh, in, in, a, in a short moment, uh, as well as a new managing editor, uh, Anna Maria Andreva, uh, who is um, also um, uh, editor uh, at ICCT and, uh, and a researcher here. Uh, we're particularly proud uh, to have uh, brought together uh, that team. Uh, and I should also highlight um, that this team of co-editors uh, are being supported by an equally amazing team of associate editors and an editorial board uh, who are all listed uh, on the website and you can uh, have a look. And I should say that we're extremely grateful to all of them uh, who have accepted to join the team for some of them uh, or to continue supporting uh, perspectives on terrorism for a number of them who were already part of the uh, previous uh, uh, board or team of associate editors. And finally, um, I should say, uh, because we also just released uh, the new issue uh, of perspectives on terrorism, uh, please have a look. Uh, there is a number of uh, articles uh, that are extremely interesting in this uh, new issue, uh, including uh, a special section uh, on anti-government extremism uh, that was edited by uh, Tore uh, Bjorgo at uh, CIREX at the University of uh, Oslo, 
uh, but also uh, other uh, research articles and uh, research notes uh, published by uh, a number of prominent uh, authors in, in, in this field. I am now very happy uh, to uh, give the floor um, to Alex, uh, Alex B. Schmidt, uh, to share uh, some of his personal thoughts on the history of terrorism studies and the role the perspectives on terrorism uh, played in that field. Uh, also, to acknowledge, um, again, uh, the uh, major role that Alex has played both uh, in this field of terrorism studies and obviously as a uh, founding uh, figure uh, of the journal, uh, one of the three founding figures of the journal uh, perspectives on terrorism. Uh, Alex has obviously uh, been uh, a reference uh, a source of inspiration for uh, a lot of us uh, in in this field, and so um, it is um, it is a great honor uh, to work with him and uh, and to have him uh, here. I don't think Alex needs a lot of introduction, but nonetheless, uh, it is custom, so uh, I will still do it. Uh, but um, Prof. Alex P. Schmidt is a distinguished uh, fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism and also the director of the Terrorism Research. Uh, initiative. He has been in the past professor uh, at Leiden University and at Erasmus University in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, and also he was the director uh, of uh, the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence, CSTPV, uh, as well, and worked uh, for uh, UNODC, among uh, many other things. Uh, Alex has, above all, published what I think could qualify as an entire library on his own uh, of books and papers uh, on uh, terrorism, uh, some of which we are very proudly hosting uh, on ICT's uh, website, including uh, the handbook on uh, terrorism prevention and preparedness that you can find on ICT's website or his latest paper uh, on defining uh, terrorism. Uh, Alex, again, was a founding figure of perspectives uh, of terrorism. He was editor-in-chief for many years and now remains, and we're very glad, remains as a co-editor uh, of Perspectives on Terrorism. So, Alex, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas, for your kind words. It's a happy moment for me to pass over this uh, journal to uh, James Forrest, who has been my co-editor and colleague and friend for many years. In fact, I also wanted him to follow me up in St. Andrews when I left there in uh, 2009. At that time, I was co-editor next to David Rappaport of Terrorism and Political Violence, uh, one of the major commercial journals in the field. Our journal uh, has its origin uh, in uh, 2007, 2008, one of my researchers at the terrorism prevention branch of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, where I was officer in charge, was Robert Wesley. And uh, he and I came up with the idea, which he realized, because in the first two years, he really took the lead and was the founding editor. And uh, he also started the Terrorism Research Initiative, uh, which was a charity, still exists uh, in North Carolina, which was the parent organization, which then later passed on to ISCA at the University of Leiden, and now as of today to uh, ICCT. The situation of terrorism research and of journals was quite different in Europe uh, than in the United States until the Madrid bombings of 2004 and the London bombings of 2005, one thought that uh, Europe was not that much affected. And therefore, it was difficult to start a research initiative here. We managed to bring together 16 institutes and over 100 scholars uh, and create a network. Such networks are uh, normal these days, but at that time it was quite an effort to bring it together. The first issues of the journal were irregular. Sometimes uh, we had 12 issues in one year, but thin ones. 
sometimes in the year 2009 when I took over only two. I'd like to quote you three sentences from the mission statement as I formulated it then for the journal. And I quote, the mission of the Terrorism Research Initiative and its journal is the promotion of three C's, coordination, cooperation, and collaboration among individuals conducting research and analysis on terrorism and related political violence. We at TREE, I wrote, see perspectives on terrorism as a synergetic networking platform that serves the needs of the research and analytical communities. Our aim is to be practical, helpful, and useful to all those who subscribe to the mission of enhancing security through collaborative research. That was our mission statement. The journal's title uh, refers to the, our conviction that truth is unlikely to be found in any single perspective, and that debate is the lifeblood of both academic scholarship and civil society. We try to be a low threshold journal uh, because we wanted to open it for young scholars who could not afford to pay the fees, sometimes the thousands of dollars that commercial journals now ask for the privilege of being published in them. In order to create a, such a, a network, we created national networks of PhD writers. Uh, some of them functioned better than others. And we also issued since 2013 an award for the best uh, doctoral thesis in terrorism and counterterrorism studies. And that award has been uh, going on first every year, then every second year. And actually, you are just uh, looking at one of the winners of uh, this award. Thomas Renard got this award for the best uh, thesis on counterterrorism in 2021. And if you look at the announcement section of the current issue of Perspectives on Terrorism, you see that a new round has been announced with a deadline of mid-May, and yesterday already received the first submission for this new round. So these are some of the things that uh, we tried to do, and some other things did not succeed so well. But the award and the journal are two of the remaining and still a blooming uh, elements of the perspectives on terrorism. We had always uh, difficulties of finding funds because uh, we could not pay the authors. We did not want to ask money from the readers. And while the costs were not high, uh, maintaining a journal online is bringing some costs. Crowdfunding we tried, but was not very successive. If you look now at the field of terrorism studies as a whole, it is only one journal among 200 that are publishing regularly, and some cases mainly articles on terrorism, most of them still paper-based. Ours was never paper-based. And in order to see what's going on in this field, you have to monitor it. And we have for this uh, purpose uh, several scholars, including Dr. Judith Tinnes of the Leibniz Institute, who produces in every issue unique bibli bibliographies. She already has, for instance, published the seventh on uh, Daesh or ISIS. And this is something that no other journal in the field does. We also have a conference calendar, we have uh, regular book reviews. So this sets this uh, journal apart from others. And I'm sure that in uh, this new format, it will increase its uh, readership, which is already quite high, uh, around 8,000. That might uh, look that not that high, but I remember when I had a responsibility for, for the leading journal at that time, Perspectives on uh, Terrorism, we actually had only 550 subscribers, 450 of them were university libraries, and about 100 were individuals. So high were the prices that a uh, few people could afford it. That might have increased a little bit, but it's nowhere near the level of an electronic journal like Perspectives on Terrorism. 
And that has given us such a wide range in civil society, in the analytical community, and of course in academia. And uh, we have always prided ourselves to be a low access journal, but still uh, three out of four submissions we cannot publish because the quality is not enough. And for the remainder, we usually advise, uh, revise and rewrite, and then uh, we manage to publish this. So the reviewers, the anonymous reviewers, uh, have an enormous impact on the quality of uh, the journal, improving uh, what are promising articles and making them uh, outstanding articles. And that is the work of uh, the editors, associate editors, and the reviewers. And I'm sure that uh, this uh, cultivation of the reviewers will go on in the new uh, format of the journal. I'm sure that James Forrest is uh, observing that the quality will be the same and perhaps be even be improved and broadened. So I wish him well. And for the first year, at least, I will accompany from the sidelines in keeping this journal at the level it is. And I thank Thomas for becoming, for ICCT becoming the parent organization of a perspectives on terrorism. Back to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex. And, and, and again, we are so, so grateful to, to all the work you did and indeed to trusting us uh to basically continue uh working and building on 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 this great legacy uh, of perspectives on on terrorism uh now i would like to turn to the panel uh and before uh introducing the panelists and um and the discussion uh maybe uh just a few uh house rules um there will be some time uh to ask questions to the panelists uh, if you have any question please um uh, raise them in uh, the q a uh space that you see at the bottom uh of your screen uh, please do not use the chat uh function but only the q a uh, that is what it is uh, for, stands for questions and answers. Uh, the answers will be provided orally by the panelists. Uh, and uh, and I'll try, I'll monitor uh, those questions and, and try to make sure that we address uh, these. Uh, and also, I would like to highlight that um, Alex Schmidt uh, will uh, also be available to answer uh, any question you might have. So you can uh, ask questions to uh, the panelists or uh to alex schmidt uh who and we will answer all of these questions uh at the same time towards the end of this uh webinar uh so i am very pleased uh to be joined for this discussion on uh the state uh of terrorism studies by uh four distinguished uh speakers and also uh members of the editorial team of perspectives on terrorism so with us today uh we have uh, Professor James Forrest, uh, who is professor at, in the School of Criminology and Justice Studies at UMass Lowell in the United States, and also a distinguished fellow at ICCT and the editor in chief, the new editor in chief, indeed succeeding Alex Schmidt of Perspectives on uh, Terrorism. Uh, he is notably the author of several books, including uh, The Terrorism Lectures, a collection of materials for terrorism students, and Essentials of Counter terrorism. Also with us uh, is Prof. Tim Wilson, uh, who is Senior Lecturer at the University of St. Andrews and Director of the Handa Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence, known as CSTPV, and a new co-editor uh, of Perspectives on Terrorism. He's a historian uh, by training, and his latest book was, uh, or is, uh, Killing Strangers, How Political Violence Became Modern, which I highly recommend. Also with us uh, is uh, Greg Klein. Dr. Greg Klein is Assistant Professor at Leiden University, a uh, member of the Terrorism and Political Violence Research Group, and also a new co-editor of Perspectives on Terrorism. Uh, he's uh, particularly versed in uh, quantitative uh, analysis and has published many articles on terrorism in various prominent 
journals and policy-oriented outlets. And last but not least, uh, with us also Joanna Cook. Dr. Joanna Cook is Senior Project Manager at ICCT and co-editor of Perspectives on Terrorism. She is also an Assistant Professor of Terrorism and Political Violence at Leiden University. And she is the author of many articles and books, including A Woman's Place, U.S. Counterterrorism Since 9-11, and most recently, The Rule is None But Allah, Islamist Approaches to governments, to government covenants, sorry, which she co-edited with Shiraz Maher uh, at King's College London. Now that uh, I have quickly introduced uh, my fellow panelists, uh, let me then turn uh, to the questions. Uh, and the way I will proceed uh, is basically by asking questions to um, two of the panelists uh, every time, giving them uh, a chance in turn to answer uh, these questions. And my first question is for uh, for James and Tim, for James Forrest and Tim Wilson. Uh, and maybe starting with you, James, if, you, if you're low, um, how in your view has the field of terrorism studies evolved since you started uh, working in it? Basically, um, how in, in, in your personal view, uh, drawing on your personal experience, on, on, on some anecdotes, how has the field evolved? What are, in your view, the key achievements or the key progress uh, that you have been able uh, to see over the past over the past uh, years and decades? Okay, uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, when I began in this field over a couple of decades ago, much of the research was on terrorist group actions, specific threats, leaders, state sponsorship of terrorism, and most often within political science departments. Uh, now there's a broad diversity of topics being studied. There's lots of new and useful data sets available on incidents, profiles of groups and individuals. The use of court records and building databases has been, has been good to see. Um, more people are studying terrorism from multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives, and there's more people worldwide doing it. Uh, new journals like Perspectives on Terrorism in which to publish their research has emerged. There's lots of new undergraduate and graduate uh, courses and degree programs in this area in multiple countries and even online, like at St. Andrews University and University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, these programs are increasingly found in disciplines outside of political science, sociology, military, government studies, criminology. Um, there's been an increase uh, focused on the psychology that drives the deviant criminal behavior we call terrorism. And we have better conceptual clarity on the processes of radicalization towards violent extremism. There's been more focus on the intersections of crime and terrorism leading to more uh, nuanced insights about decision-making, enabling contexts, government responses, and so forth. There's been new research on the internal vulnerabilities of terrorist networks and how these vulnerabilities can inform counterterrorism strategies. There's freely available resources like the Harmony Documents Database of the CTC at West Point or the Abbottabad Documents Database, and these provide useful insights in these areas. Uh, there's been new research on the reasons why people disengage from terrorism, there's been new research on the roles of women in terrorist movements, as well as their involvement in disengagement efforts. Um, there's been new research on the roles of others outside government in combating terrorism more effectively. Seems like many years ago, the focus and expectation was exclusively on how governments should defeat terrorism. But the new broader focus is especially important today, especially regarding domestic terrorist movements. Um, governments play an important role, but in partnership with communities. And finally, it seems to be more encouragement to place terrorism within a proper context of threats and security. There is not a terrorist around every corner. There's not a terrorist under your bed. There's a greater focus on public education and resilience and also recognizing the need to resist overreacting to the threat of terrorism. So those are my initial observations. Let me turn it back over to you now, Thomas. Thanks a lot, um, James. Maybe I'll, I'll ask you just a quick uh, follow-up question uh, based on on what you just said. Um, I mean, you've been um, you've been teaching terrorism and counterterrorism uh, for for quite quite several years now, uh, and you've even published indeed several volumes of these terrorism lectures. Uh, what would you say is the main difference between like? how you were teaching terrorism uh, many years ago and how you would be teaching it now in terms of approaches, um, topics. I mean, you've already touched upon some of these things, but I would be very curious like in, in like how you teaching, basically, how, how has the evolution of our field impacted you? Um, well, one of the things that uh, personally I enjoy is the um, comparative analysis approach. 
So drawing on multiple case studies from different parts of the world um, and you know, teasing out some of the similarities and differences, uh, whether it's uh, examples of uh, violent extremism in Israel, Palestinian territories, uh, Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, Spain, Northern Ireland, uh, Colombia, so forth, and getting students to realize that this is um, a type of criminal deviant behavior that individuals across a broad uh, walks of life and backgrounds have engaged in over the last you know, multiple centuries, really and getting them to to get a historical perspective and also the global uh, comparative perspective, I think, has been very helpful for them to realize that uh, you know there's there's um, uh, there's a lot of uh, rich material to to dive into now uh, that um, helps you know understand this 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 behavior. Okay, thanks, Dr. James. Um, Tim, turning uh, to you with the same question, what is your view on the evolution of the field of terrorism studies? I realize it's dangerous to ask a, a, a long view to, to the historian, but uh, still, uh, I will do that. So uh, how has this field evolved uh, from, your, from your point of view, from your perspective? You're a brave man, Thomas. How long, how long have you got? Um, I mean, I should, I should really open by... Um, I mean, stating, stating my credentials do not measure up at all to, to those of James as a long server in the field. I'm, uh, I'm really a refugee from history who, who ended up at CSTPV and then inherited the crown as director in 2016. So, um, you know, huge respect for predecessors, including Alex, who have uh, sat, sat in this chair before me. Uh, and I, the reason I say that is I think one of the things that has changed that obviously I welcome is the the greater role and awareness and sensitivity to uh, the importance of history in, in studying terrorism and, and past experience generally. Uh, and in fairness to those of you who have been laboring in the vineyard of terrorism studies for decades, you know, it's not all been their fault that history hasn't enjoyed a higher profile. Historians have, you know, sometimes shown a kind of horrendous kind of hauteur and kind of condescension to the study of terrorism. Um, Sir Michael Howard, the distinguished late historian of war at Oxford, you know, I think famously said that terrorism studies was responsible for more bad books than any other subject with the exception of sociology. Um, so, you know, that is not the tradition is it, that, that I stand in at all, but it, it is worth saying there has been something of a void, I think, or there was a void uh, when I sort of first began to get involved uh, a little over a decade ago. And that it's very, very welcome to see that begin to change. You know, David Rappaport's seminal article, Four Waves of Rebel Terrorism, is a classic contribution. Is what I think of as a kind of checkpoint article. You can't travel that road of looking at past um, terrorism without uh, passing through that checkpoint, so to speak. Um, it's not the last words. You know, ten, ten pages on, on the history of terrorism is, is, is not all there is to say uh, at all. And so I think, you know, one of the really encouraging um, signs has been uh, a greater sensitivity to what historians can bring, including contextual uh, insight, the sense in which political violence never stands totally apart from its own times. Um, you know, I think there have been times in terrorism studies in the more distant past where perhaps because of urgent policy agendas, so on and so forth, uh, there's been a sort of need for you know scholarship in a in, in a hurry. That's not to caricature the whole field as that, um, but you know at, at its at its worst, I think terrorism studies has been a little bit like kind of shoals of damselfish on the Great Barrier Reef. You know we swing to uh, any tide that you know seems to be dominant, um, and it's really great to see uh, sort of counter countercurrents, see see the field begin to mature. I think the sheer persistence of the Islamist threat means that we're now beginning to see. A sort of scholarship that has much more, to borrow a phrase from anthropology, much more thick description to it. You know, I'm thinking of um, perhaps invidious to single out a few works, but Thomas Heghammer's *The Caravan*, Yusuf Clausen's *Western Jihadism*. Um, you know, these are serious pieces of uh, historicized scholarship that you know really are deeply marinated in um, research over decades and, 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 and observation. So I think there's a sort of um, for me, as someone who didn't know much about Islamist terrorism before I joined CSTPV, I think one can now turn to a, a shelf full of books that, that you know, really help bring that um, phenomenon into um, perspective. 
So uh, that I, the, the final thing I'd just say is I think the, the field's become more mature and reflective. I think um, sort of work of Bart Sherman, Andrew Silk are on sort of review articles of, you know, how is the trying to capture a sort of overview of the field and how it's developing. Lisa Stamnitsky's wonderful sociology of how the field um, developed. Uh, these are really encouraging signs. So um, I guess I would end with a sort of, you know, the, the historians lament that golden ages are never golden ages when you're living through them. Um, but in some ways, I think the last 10 years have been a golden age for terrorism studies. Thanks a lot, um, Tim. Um, and maybe, I mean, just to, to, to push you a bit uh, on like the, the, the the unique perspective than uh, than historians can bring. I mean, I mean, this obviously could be the beginning of of a whole lecture, if not a series of lecture. Obviously, but what would be uh, from your from your point of view the key um, uh, the key insights or like uh, core added value that history has brought uh, to this field? What I mean, what key lessons have you been able to 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 bring uh not you personally but history as a discipline to to this field I, I try and keep it short and sharp um in any longer term historical perspective terrorism is weird violence it's weird violence because it's very impersonal violence slaughtering typically um I think Alex's wonderful consensus definition about, you know, uh, terrorism victims are message generators is a wonderful starting point for a historical inquiry, because I don't think this goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. Yes, one can find uh, some examples that bear some relationship with Sakari 2000 years ago and so on. They exist, but as a kind of consistent and repetitive um phenomenon i think this belongs pretty much to the modern age of the last 200 years it's it's connected with much broader processes of modernization if we understand them we might understand something about it but you know killing people who've never done anything to you that's weird thanks thanks a lot tim uh now for uh my second question i'd like to turn to um to joanna and greg um and maybe starting uh, with you, Joe, uh, if you if you accept. Um, in light of uh, all the research that has been published uh, in terrorism, and we've heard that increasing number uh, of research published over the past few years uh, on on terrorism and counterterrorism, is it your view that we understand now the phenomenon better? Uh, why is that or why isn't the case? Uh, and basically, what in your view has contributed most to the progress, the stagnation or the decline uh, in, in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, this is a great panel to be a part of, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be able to sit alongside some of these, um, some of these uh, key figures in the field. And I think um, Tim and James really opened with a, a really helpful overview of the field and where we sit. And, uh, you know, from their comments, we can see that the field really has expanded and strengthened. And I think we do understand terrorism quite a bit better. Um, you know, I I was the 9-11 generation where we grew up and, you know, saw 9-11 in the world unfolding there. And it was quite a, a unique phenomenon, um, particularly for that generation. And so we went from trying to understand where and how people would join terrorism to understanding better what types of people under what circumstances with what uh, trajectory of, um, of factors might be more likely to do that, but we're certainly not, not quite there yet in fully understanding um, who will ultimately um, undergo terrorism, who will not, if you're, if you're faced, um, if you have a thousand people with the same circumstances who ultimately won't be a terrorist. Um, but what I think, uh, I'm going to give just one example where I think we've really come to understand this a bit better based on, on some of the research I've been focused on for, uh, for a decade now. But one of the areas we really understand better is uh, the involvement of women uh, and gendered aspects of terrorism. And, you know, I think traditionally there was a view that women um, were not really involved in terrorism. You know, they weren't necessarily always on the front lines. Um, a lot of research that was published on women in, in relation to terrorism wasn't in the Kin Key um, terrorism journal um, or terrorism studies journals or really being integrated or taken up by mainstream terrorism research. But we can't say this is the case anymore. And um, me and uh, my colleague, Devorah Margolin, have just done a 50-year a systematic review of, of literature on women in terrorism. That's a, it's a working paper right now, but uh, we've just presented it at ISA. And we've identified and, uh, and assessed 661 academic peer-reviewed publications on the topic of women in terrorism. Uh, you know, We excluded almost 1,000 that didn't quite meet the criteria, but it just speaks to the amount of 
volume there, but um, you know, some of the some of the kind of findings that we had that I think really emphasize how we better know this and how we're focusing on it a lot more is that between 1970 and the year 2000, there were only 42 articles which discussed women in terrorism and 619 since 2001 now. And the top three years for publications on women in terrorism have all been since 2018, the highest number of which was uh, 2021 with 69 publications on the topic. So there was really a large uptake and an uh, expansion of, of research in this field. But it's also uh, speaking to some of the trends we've seen more traditionally in the field where it's quite responsive. So we saw thousands of women go from around the world to join a group like ISIS. And a lot of the, the focus in this field has continued to be responsive um, and, and again, largely focused on ISIS. Um, speaking to some of the, I'm just gonna highlight a couple uh, more kind of key points from this because I think it's really helpful to outline the state of the field and how this particular topic aligns with it, but you know, only 25% of the journal articles which discussed women in terrorism were, were actually in the top nine uh, terrorism studies journals. 72% um, of those pieces were single authored, so there wasn't a lot of collaboration um, in the space still. And uh, there was still uh, a large focus on this, particularly from Western European and um, North American scholars, almost 76% uh, of that research was authored by folks from North America and Western Europe, and 50% of it was focused on Islamists. So, uh, it does highlight a lot of focus and um, knowledge being developed in, in certain areas, but, uh, you know, again, to the detriment of other, other areas. Um, so just a couple kind of concluding uh, points here. You know, we are starting to look at women uh, in more complex ways through a gendered lens that considers unique and shared drivers and pathways to extremism, the roles within the groups, gendered considerations within ideologies and in areas like rehabilitation and reintegration. Um, but this has also prompted us to start thinking more about uh, gendered analysis more broadly. So considering things like men and masculinities vis-a-vis -vis violent extremism, which is, I think, is quite encouraging. And uh, I know for a lot of my colleagues who focused a lot on areas like um, propaganda or some of the, uh, the harder areas being um, studied in, in terrorism studies, there's also been a lot more focus on um, research or mental health as well, which I think is quite, quite important. So um, you know, whether it was colleagues like uh, Elizabeth Pearson or Charlie Winter, who have um, all kind of um, uh, presented research and, and publications on things like researcher safety, researcher mental health, and then, um, you know, people like James Khalil have offered guides to interviewing terrorists and how to do this in a, in a much safer way as well. I think it's encouraging to see the kind of focus on, on those areas uh, of terrorism research in particular. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Joe. I mean, if I uh, just follow up quickly uh, with, with one quick question. Um, in, in your view, this increased focus on uh, on women in terrorism is that, and, and you kind of already alluded to that, but just want to push you a little bit further there. Um, does that reflect a reality or at least a perception that women are more involved in terrorism? Or does that reflect rather like a previous inability to recognize the role that women were playing in some of these terrorist organization? Like, I think a lot of it has been, you focus on the actors who take up the guns, you focus on folk, the, the leadership. Um, I mean, a lot of it is focused on the very, very hard end of these groups. And I think as we've become more progressive with trying to understand the broader environments in which these groups um, evolve, the broad network of actors that have some kind of affiliation with them. Um, I mean, it is, it, it has proven to be, I think, quite a useful environment to, to think about women in terrorism more. And then, again, the very responsive nature of terrorism studies, you know, why did, why did my neighbor uh, in Canada or the UK or Spain uh, all of a sudden decide to pick up and go join a, a terrorist group in Syria? So it became, I think, a lot more publicized and, and personal for, for a lot of uh, individuals who might not have thought about this before, too. So um, it, it is kind of two, two ways. So just a, a broader expansion of trying to understand these, these groups, actors and networks a lot more effectively, um, but also the real um, response that we're dealing with uh, in the face of ISIS and, and thousands of women from around the world mobilizing and joining uh, this group. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Joe. Um, Greg, turning to you uh, now also with the same question, uh, do we understand uh, terrorism better uh, now? Uh, why or why not? Sure. Thanks, Thomas. And, uh, you know, first, thanks uh, for being part of this panel. And, and I really look forward to representing uh, Institute of Security Global Affairs as uh, one of the co-editors for, for Perspectives on Terrorism in this transition. 
Um, and I think the the short answer to Thomas's question is is yes, we understand more. Um, I don't see how we we couldn't, considering Brian Phillips' new article in in Terrorism and Political Violence. Can I mention that journal here? Um, you know, he just wrote that we have about six thousand new articles uh, since two thousand one. So we must have learned something. We must understand something more. Um, and so I think, from my perspective as a political scientist, we've made some tremendous advances in understanding different strategies of terrorism, uh, thinking about the effects of terrorist violence on voting behavior, different socioeconomic, political motivations uh, for individuals supporting terrorist groups, and also how political institutions and, and different systems can create opportunities for terrorist groups and, and influence the level, the intensity, the frequency of terrorist attacks. Uh, but I do think that as a field, sometimes we we walk this tightrope and have to balance with the political saliency of terrorism and the attention that large attacks get and, and that new or extraordinary violent groups or movements kind of receive our attention. And sometimes research is driven towards trying to analyze these new and emerging threats and, and may risk losing track of or, or, or kind of pulling away from developing more overarching theories and kind of analyzing the implications of our theories. Um, and part of this, again, is the sanity. Part of this is reflective of ICCT and, and think and do tanks and, and trying to make the research applicable to current events. Um, but at times, I think that also uh, limits some of the more scientific theory building and, and kind of higher level understanding of what's driving this violence and, and how it might be manipulating uh, politics or, or manipulating um, different types of support. And so in thinking back to your question, Thomas, of course, again, that answer is, is yes. Um, but I also think compared to many other research fields in political violence or armed conflict, our theory building endeavors or the theory building side of what we do um, has actually maybe slowed down a little bit as we've gotten further and further from 2001 and trying to understand what happened. Uh, because as I think we develop less about the phenomenon as a whole uh, and a little bit becomes a little overshadowed of understanding or analyzing the new developments and, and evolutions and adaptations in, in terrorism terrorist violence and counterterrorism. Um, and so I think what might really highlight where this kind of continued pursuit and, and balancing act between trying to analyze new events and staying very relevant to current events, which I, I don't think we can't be, um, given, given how uh, salient this is and how much attention terrorist attacks receive, that we're really good, again, in analyzing and researching changes in, in tactics and new targets and propaganda and recruitment um, radicalization processes, as my colleagues have pointed to today, and why individuals might join and, and act on these violent urges. Um, but I think at a, a cross-sectional or that, that cross-national, cross-group level analysis or, or perspective that we can bring, I think we still struggle to identify when or why groups or movements begin using terrorism tactics or essentially become a terrorist group. And so we can understand how this violence looks and changes once it starts, but I think we still struggle to understand what kind of initiates a group to, especially political organizations, to start using these violent tactics um, rather than more traditional political tactics. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, maybe just a quick follow-up question for you as well. Um, if you if you think back, so you say, well, um, there's been uh, 6,000 uh, articles uh, since 2001, and um, and a lot of these are focused on latest developments, trends, analysis of this, and not enough theoretical work. But still, I guess there must have been some. So I just wanted to push you a little bit on that. Like, what are like maybe one or two works um, theoretically driven that you think have contributed um, tremendously to to this field uh, over the past sure. few years? Uh, I think one of the ones that that I, I think is, is essential to this, if we look at um, Ken and Walter's 2006 week strategies of terrorism. They, they lay out kind of five ways terrorist groups use violence, why they're using violence. And, you know, it's, there's outbidding, there's provocation, um, attrition. And, and so what we think about these groups is, is what that's then kind of developed or, or, or it, it pushed a whole almost subfield within in, research, in terrorism research that there's been then evolving debates of, of if we think about strategies and that there's this rational application of terrorism or it's logical, then we must see it work at some point. Yet a lot of the research tells us that terrorism does not necessarily work as this political tactic, that you don't necessarily get uh, the things that you're trying to bargain for. And so it's it's kind of developed this entire um, debate. And, and, and that's what I think when I'm talking more about kind of the, the higher arching 
um, theoretical debates that if we can drive that there's these five rationales or five strategies of why groups will engage in terrorist tactics, we then start to unpack, is it successful? Is it not successful? Are there limitations to when these could be used? Are we, we thinking about success in the right way of the ultimate um, political goal of a group wants to separate from a state? Will it achieve that separation? Um, or is there lower levels of, of the strategic acting um, when we think about trying to mobilize more support, recruitment, gain more resources, and essentially just trying to keep the movement alive? Um, and so I think that's the type of debate that I think sometimes gets lost as, as researchers, um, as, as we try to kind of speak to the latest and current events and apply some research to explain what's going on. Um, I think sometimes rather than sitting down and trying to process and understand um, at a higher kind of phenomenon or, or kind of theoretical level of, of thinking about why this violence might be occurring. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, maybe going back to um, a second round of question to 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 the panelists uh, before turning to to the audience. So please uh, continue uh, shooting questions to to the Q and A. Um, question for um, James uh, and Tim again. Um, so we've discussed a bit where this field is coming from, but maybe I'd like also to discuss with you what are the remaining uh, gaps or limitation in the field of terrorism studies in terms of how it is structured, uh, in terms of uh, the influence of key stakeholders in it, or how priorities are being determined in terms of methodologies, uh, in terms of disciplines that are uh, prominent or not uh, prominent enough in your view. Uh, so basically just asking a bit also where the field is going and whether it is going in the right direction. And if not, then can we still change uh, course? So it is a very long question. Uh, and uh, I still would like to give you uh, up to five minutes to, to answer it. But uh, James, turning to you first. OK, uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, as an optimist by nature, uh, I think the field is generally heading in the right direction uh, in terms of producing more data sets, empirical evidence for use uh, for testing theories, expanding our understanding of terrorism and effective counterterrorism. Uh, it's of course great to see an international community of scholars engaged in the field of study. Uh, applications to the degree programs that I mentioned in the field have remained strong. Um, but that said, I think we, we may now be seeing a bit of um, attention exhaustion among the public and government leaders when it comes to anything terrorism or counterterrorism. And you combine that with the shift toward great power competition, uh, this may impact uh, availability of government funding for research in our field, for example. Uh, in terms of research topics, I think we still have a lot more work to do in terms of uh, how and when to assess the effects of counterterrorism efforts, particularly in terms of what has successfully encouraged individuals to voluntarily disengage from terrorist activity uh, and what sort of reintegration policies or programs are needed. On a similar note, we need more research on the ways in which counterterrorism measures have affected communities uh, to include uh, eroding civil liberties, exacerbating social tensions. Um, there's a need for policy relevant research on how to effectively mitigate the threat of far right and far left violent extremism before it gets worse. Um, some broad consensus on the definitions of the terms that we use in our research, particularly when coding our data, uh, that'd be a huge benefit to the field. Um, we also need new research on how new and emerging technologies might offer surprising and possibly deadly new opportunities for, for terrorist attacks, um, not just drones or artificial intelligence, um, but the rise, of, you know, the rise of deep fakes and virtual realities, of course, but uh, others that we may not have yet recognized as a potential threat. Uh, finally, I was thinking um, if I were to give advice to someone who's just now beginning their career in the field of terrorism and counterterrorism studies, uh, I'd offer probably about five recommendations to start off with. Um, first, you know, try to read as much as you can about a variety of terrorism or counterterrorism related topics, including some that might even, not even seem relevant to you at first. Um, you never know when that aha moment is going to lead to new promising research questions. Um, second, I encourage uh, students and new researchers to try and study why people who are just like you in terms of beliefs, values, social demographic background, and so forth, have chosen to engage in terrorist violence. We need to continually confront the mistaken notion that it's only certain types of people, it's only them who engage in terrorism. Um, third, collaborate with others when you can, especially across disciplines and with practitioners. If possible, try to collaborate across national and cultural contexts as well. Uh, fourth, on a somewhat related note, uh, be open to different theories, explanations for what you may be finding in your research. Be willing to challenge your assumptions. 
And finally, we need to ensure the highest levels of integrity in this field. We should demand transparency, accountability, moral and ethical behavior of ourselves and each other, especially given the high potential for political bias in terrorism and counterterrorism research. So those are just some uh, hopefully useful recommendations. And I turn it back to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, James. And indeed, these are excellent recommendations, uh, I think, for uh, young, I mean, for students and young scholars, but I would say also maybe for some established scholars. Uh, so definitely, uh, definitely worth uh, taking uh, into account. Um, Tib, uh, turning to you with the, the same question indeed as well. Are we heading in the right direction? What are we doing well? What are, do we need to change of course? Well, as a, as a publisher's son and an academic, I can do no better than echo James's last point about read more. The only answer to the question, how much should I read more? Um, also read books that don't have terrorism in the title, you know, uh, <laughs> read more, read more widely. I'd, I'd absolutely echo that. In terms of whether the, the field is going in the right direction, I think there has been enormous progress and I think that continues and I think will. I do take James's point about potential exhaustion of the policy community. Um, and, you know, I think that that is on my mind to some degree, because there is a lot to still to do. I think, you know, Joe has powerfully highlighted the, um, you know, really just how recently the field has begun to sort of look at women in terrorism and counterterrorism in a serious way. Um, there's so much more to be done. Um, I do worry about global reach, you know, that terrorism studies is essentially a kind of has its roots in the Anglophone academic world, uh, North America, UK, and parts of Western Europe where there's a lot of English speakers. Yeah, that's not where most of the terrorism is happening these days. Um, so there's a kind of capacity issue, I think, around um, particularly Africa, which seems to be, you know, topping the charts for all the wrong reasons for, in, in terms of intensity of terrorism. And, you know, terrorism, I think, in you know, instances like Nigeria or whatever, it's very embedded in deeper insurgencies. So it's kind of not as, as clean cut, but I do think we need to sort of build capacity and not lose interest just because there seem to have been, thank goodness, you know, fewer attacks in, in North America and, and Western Europe. Having said that, we have built such a formidable kind of series of counter terrorist um, uh, policies and agencies across various governments. I think the momentum uh, will continue for, for some time. So from that point of view, I'm broadly optimistic. I do think there's a bit of a kind of a bit of an empty sandwich as I think of it. You know, we've got kind of uh, great literatures on sort of, you know, IR, international relations, economics, political science, at the sort of macro level. We've got um, uh, some very good literatures that tend to focus on the individuals, you know, sort of radicalization literature, psychology, criminology. Um, when you open up your sandwich between those two sort of mezzanine type analysis, particularly the kind of uh, what James actually references sort of comparative case studies, that sort of thing, um, that isn't trying to be global and isn't trying to be just the individual, um, obviously history, but, you know, anthropology too, you know, it's, it's a bit of a disappointing feeling. I think we could we could still do more there. But but generally, like James, I, I am an optimist. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, we always need uh, optimists around ourselves to feel... Uh... <laughs> to feel better uh so you're oh, great uh, optimism you're... of the will pessimism of the intellect as gramsci said all right <laughs> um joe and uh, and greg turning uh to you for a last question before uh opening up to questions from the audience um and joe maybe starting again with you uh what are still the key knowledge gaps in your view or, or, or key topics that require further uh research what research topics should we prioritize right now yeah, like I, I think we are a field that loves to do systematic reviews of our own field, which is a very helpful thing. And I think a lot of the, the thematic and knowledge gaps that have been highlighted historically still remain to differing extents. So again, right, there's been so much focus on jihadism for, for so many years now, but I think to the detriment of better understanding right-wing extremism, for example, or, or other areas like um, single issue terrorism, um, distinguishing links between online activity and offline action, um, the the regional focus is a, is a big one. Um, there has been a lot of focus on the, on the MENA region, but this has also come, I think, at the neglect of other areas, including uh, Africa and Asia. With, there is more research coming up on that, but uh, it has very, very much dominated or been dominated by uh, that one specific region. Um, and, you know, there was an interesting review that's just come out by uh, Moskalenko et al. And it highlighted several areas for growth opportunities, which uh, I don't think have really come up. So I just want to um, give them a mention here. But thematically, they've highlighted areas such as uh, the role of grievances 
uh, and the role of emotions in radicalization and terrorism, which I think kind of also highlights some of the, the evolution in thinking in this field or, or new areas to potentially pursue. And I know uh, based on a lot of the work I've been doing recently, um, there's several areas I think really could use a lot more focus. And um, again, I've been focusing a lot on ISIS affiliated families and doing a lot of uh, work in Iraq as well. And um, better understanding how family networks are impacted by um, that affiliation to violent extremism, I think, is, is very important. So not just, you know, really expanding from the risk of uh, recruitment, which has often kind of framed the, the discussion, but really looking a lot more at how is the life of a child impacted when a family member is involved in violent extremism? How do you rehabilitate or reintegrate uh, families that have uh, that kind of stigma um, of being associated with a, a terrorist actor. Um, you know, if the work in Iraq, for example, there's 30,000 individuals, uh, women and children largely, that are currently having to be rehabilitated and reintegrated, but have not actually conducted any violent action, but are, are viewed as associated with ISIS. Um, and there's been a lot of interesting work recently in on rehabilitation and reintegration of terrorist actors in, in non-Western settings. So there's been more work recently on um, Al-Shabaab, for example, Niger work in uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria. But again, I don't think there's been a lot of um, comparison of, of how these rehabilitation uh, programs have worked, what those reintegration programs have succeeded in doing or where they potentially have uh, been more limited. Um, we see a lot of big changes in the world today, too, and I'd, I'd love to continue to see terrorism research speaking a little bit more with, with these topics, uh, conspiracy theories, anti-government movements and protests, um, lessening faith in, in democratic systems, I think, are, are very important for us to, to better understand and really um, integrate into how we think about uh, terrorism research today, too. Um, but also being very clear about those lines and boundaries in our research. So what is legal and extreme thought versus what is a legal uh, extreme action that could result in criminal activity? So being very clear about where our lines and boundaries in this field are, too, and a couple other very quick ones, um, research on men and masculinities, we've seen a little bit more uh, evolution in that space, which I think is interesting, um, interdisciplinary research, which has been echoed. Um, we've got a book coming out on rebel governance and how that also speaks to uh, a lot of the, the focus on terrorism uh, research as well, I think is a really interesting um, consideration and assessments of tools and their use in the field, risk assessments, needs assessments, a lot, um, you know, these are uh, things that have been quite difficult for researchers to access, but they really do shape how um, individuals experience uh, and go through terrorism-related processes, investigations, assessments, and so forth. And I think it's a really important area to consider. And um, you know, as our world uh, increasingly faces the prospect of AI, um, how do these new technologies, how can they enhance research in this field? What are the limitations around AI in, in the field of terrorism research? What are the dangers of it? Um, and looking at terrorist actors themselves, what is the role of AI or how could it be used to to recruit, to radicalize, to facilitate attacks and so forth. So, you know, AI is coming up incredibly fast and it's going to, I think, impact almost every area of our lives. And, and I think it is a really important one to really think about a little bit more holistically in, uh, in the field from, from our perspective as researchers, but also uh, via terrorist actors as well. Thanks, Rodrigo. And... Uh... A lot of these topics would make very good topics for articles to submit to Perspectives on Terrorism. Um, Greg, turning um, to you with the same questions indeed. Um, if you were to advise a young researchers starting a PhD or people to submit uh, to Perspectives on Terrorism, what, uh, what should be topics of priority? Sure. Uh, I think, you know, one topic of priority that I think is maybe not ready for submission to to a journal yet, but it would be something that a, a PhD student could endeavor. Uh, I think it goes back to some of uh, what Alex and James pointed out, uh, an article in this journal in, in 2021, where one of the limitations in the field is, is just data availability. Um, and I think this goes back a little bit to, to my comment before, if we try to understand where we see terrorism begin, or kind of if, if we can think about attacks, and especially in this uh, kind of big data, data analytic world we live in, uh, we still really kind of struggle to harness the power of data or predictive modeling to to identify where attack threats come from or, or what vectors we need to really worry about. Um, and, and I think we have kind of two limitations, or I, I see two sources of limitations. Um, one is just the nature of the game, and that that's we need more data. We need better data, um, not just more data, but better data. We need to, um, as James had just said, kind of understand how we're we're coding this or defining different aspects, what we're trying to gather. Um, part of this too is that 
a lot of what we we work in and, and what we're trying to understand, um, it's going to be very hard to collect information and data on this, especially on the counterterrorism side, because a lot of this is going to be going on kind of behind the scenes and is not public information. And so oftentimes when people say this, it's, it's sometimes at a country level. And if we can abstract that more up to a, a regional or cross-national global level and, and try to get some improved data and measurements, especially of counterterrorism practices, um, I think we can improve some predictive modeling, and get a better sense of um, where terrorism threats might be emerging, um, different um, locations we need to worry about, because we're really good at getting this in, in hot spots through predictive modeling or, or high terrorism countries. Um, but outside of those, it's a little harder for these models, and we still struggle to get them um, to predict or try to forecast trends in violence or where we might be higher at risk. And, and I think second to that, and, and one where I do think that there's lots of room for, for publication, for students thinking, for, for PhD theses and dissertations. Um, oftentimes, I, I think we don't necessarily approach terrorism studies as a phenomenon in kind of the same socio-political format if we're thinking about it in terms of political violence uh, or, or other types of armed conflict. And so I think if we can move terrorism or think about terrorism as a tactic of political violence, um, or even one form of political engagement that fits somewhere in a range of activities from protesting or boycotting, rebellion and civil war, I think we can improve our understanding of kind of how, why, and, and when terrorism emerges as a viable or a rational tactic. And so therefore, when groups might adopt or begin to engage in terrorism, um, and I think this is very evident in going back to, again, how current events and the saliency of, of terrorism and the threat drive a lot of what we do. Um, as Joanna was just saying about conspiracy theories, uh, anti-government sentiment and behavior, um, you know, there's some, there's been some poking around and some exploration of, of how this might start to emerge in terms of eco-sabotage or environmental terrorism or climate change. And where right now we see um, a lot of the threat from protesters is kind of gluing themselves to things or less destructive type um, of activism. Uh, but at what point does that maybe start to tip into this, this more extreme type of violence and things that present uh, maybe a wider violent threat to, to societies? Um, so I think it's thinking about where, where do we see that crossover and what really drives maybe um, kind of more traditional or, or legitimate political action into where we cross into this terrorist violence and, and, and this political extremism uh, that I think we see lots of movements kind of on the cusp of today, but we're not quite sure of where that tipping point really is going to be or what's going to drive um, maybe the emergence or shift towards more violent tactics by some of these different groups uh, and movements. Thanks, Claude. Greg, thanks um, to all the panelists already to have uh, answered uh, this first round of questions from, uh, from my side. And now uh, I'm very happy to open up uh, to questions from the audience. And I was looking at them uh, right now and this quite a number of them already very interesting very challenging questions as well uh, so I will um, take them in uh, no particular order but I think there is one here that I would like to start with uh, several of you uh, have mentioned uh, that the field of terrorism studies was uh, still quite western centric and there is a question about this how can uh, the discipline uh, move beyond a largely global north perspective or focus uh, how can we basically address what some of you have already uh, identified uh, as a as a as a challenge or a gap or a limitation in our in our field i think uh, yeah, sure, a good question back in the early 90s uh, i edited and co-authored a volume called western responses to terrorism and uh, to my amazement, it took over a quarter of a century before somebody came up with the idea of non-Western responses to terrorism. That was actually Mike Boyle, a colleague of mine at St. Andrews, and I probably gave him the idea to the volume because he asked me also to write a foreword for it. But one of the amazing things of that volume is that the non-Western responses to terrorism are not much different from the Western responses uh, that might be explained partly by the colonial wars and the repression of colonial movements. But uh, somehow the idea exists that uh, non-Western Southern uh, response is so much different uh, to uh, what comes out of the United States or Britain or some other nations here. 
I wish it were, but uh, it isn't. May I add one more thing uh, that uh, has also not caught much attention, and that is the terrorism by states. Uh, somehow the discussion today, like in many other places, is uh, terrorism is a non-state act. But uh, when I started uh, studying terrorism and wrote a dissertation on intervention and counter-revolution in the Russian Civil War, I looked both at red terror and white terror. The whites were then uh, the reactionary insurgents. And that has gone down. And now when you look at how wars are waged, including the war in the Ukraine, uh, there is a lot of state terrorism there. And that uh, certainly deserves more attention than it currently gets so much from me. Thanks a lot, Alex. Um, anyone else in the panel would like to take on that question? If, yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah. Um, thanks, Ruben. So uh, actually, <laughs> I'm working on a, a data collection project right now. Um, that builds a little bit from what Alex was saying, and, and we're we're trying to capture um, and, and collect information on counterterrorism uh, globally, so including kind of the global south. And we are finding that terror counterterrorism um, looks quite similar on the surface between global north and global south countries, or at least how they they implement it at the state level. Um, and that might be driven by a lot of training and funding is coming from uh, global north and western European countries. Um, and what we're really seeing is, is where the difference in counterterrorism practices so far seems to be linked more to the political institutions and regimes uh, and to human rights practices. So how much these governments already kind of violate and repress their own people and their civilians, that that seems to be driving how counterterrorism looks and the practices and behavior um, a little bit more than just a global north, global south divide. Um, but how we we integrate this more and more um, kind of into in, into where we're seeing all, all the writing in terrorism studies, um, from my view, part of it, again, is a, a data limitation problem. And that in a lot of Western European, um, Western Northern countries, there's it, it's easier to collect the data. And so there's there's ways to analyze it that make it a little bit easier and cross national um, that don't require necessarily as much country expertise uh, as some um, Southern Hemisphere countries might require because there, there's problems with collecting the data and being able to then analyze what is going on um, inside that country or across nationally. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Greg. And maybe just to add uh, one aspect to to that, I would just I was going to say um, that also at Perspectives on Terrorism, we would uh, very much welcome uh, contributions, uh, basically addressing and basically taking this field uh, outside of a, of a, of a Western-centric response and also encouraging um, submissions by, uh, by scholars, young or established uh, from, uh, from other parts of, of the world. But that's just a side note. Tim, I see you unmuted yourself, so perhaps you wanted to, to jump in. No, really just to sort of, as I've already perhaps indicated that this is a big, a big problem and something I think about a lot. I think capacity is is a big issue. It's, it's partly data availability. It's partly just some of the institutional um, hurdles to building links with universities in the, in the global south and actually sort of getting, uh, you know, really sort of creating that strength and depth. But, you know, that will only begin to improve with the sort of sustained drive that Thomas has just uh, indicated with a with the journal. Um, it's yeah, it, it, it's not it's not easy at all. We've just unveiled in St. Andrews a global history of terrorism archive, which is an extraordinary um, collection of um, files that were going to go in a skip. We managed to save them. It's about sort of 1700 bulging ring binder files that sort of cover political violence and terrorism from about 1979 to sort of 1993. So it's kind of just pre the internet age. Um, and it, you know, it does try and cover the whole globe, but even that, I mean, it's a pre-internet age and it's, you know, it's predominantly Western centric media, but, um, yeah, I think awareness is the first, uh, you know, in a sense of discomfort and actually sort of actively trying to, trying to, uh, dismantle that, but it's going to be a long-term push. Thanks a lot, Tim. Uh, maybe let me focus on another question. Actually, there's a couple of questions, at least, uh, if not more, um, that sort of where... 
trying to take us a bit towards um, the rise uh, or um, at least the perceived rise, and that perhaps is up to discussion of uh, populist, uh, far right, um, uh, extremism, violent or more traditional. Uh, and I think basically, I guess, because if I want to group two questions together, I would say part of the question is, are we seeing a rise in uh, this uh, form uh, of extremism? And the other part of the question is, uh, if there is in the background, particularly, I guess, in in, in the West, in, in North America, in, in, in Europe, if there is indeed uh, in the background a rise in, in right-wing populist, radical national uh, nationalist far-right parties, sorry, uh, in the background, uh, how is that potentially affecting or field also in terms of doing research, in terms of basically ethical questions that research uh, researchers need to think about uh, when uh, engaging uh, in doing research. Um, on these groups, I assume I'm trying to, to, to interpret the questions as well here a bit, but doing research on, uh, on these groups, if indeed that ideology or that narrative is becoming more mainstreaming also in traditional um, a political uh, discourse. So two questions there, um, and Jeff, just opening up to the panel again. I don't mind taking it, Thomas, if that's all right. Um, sure. don't, if we, um, don't want to hog the discussion. Yeah, I don't think you put your finger on what is a key uh, issue, which is, is the rise of the electoral far right um, sort of co-driven or competing with the rise of sort of violent extreme right if I can use those labels. Uh, I mean, the historian in me says that, you know, the most powerful witnesses against um, sort of fascism were those who were, the, were those who experienced it and they're dying out. There's not going to be many more of them. Uh, so that sort of immunity that a lot of Western politics has had for decades is clearly on the wane. Um, and I think, you know, one of our chief barriers is, um, is essentially naivety. You know, I think you've seen that with the Shawcross Prevent Review in the UK, which, um, you know, really, I, to my mind, massively underestimates um, the problem of extreme right violence, particularly its potential for shifting the so-called Overton window. In other words, you know, the, the, the range of acceptable policy um, issues far to the right that, you know, plenty of people might online, I'm speculating admittedly, but might online look at, say, the kind of horrendous murders in Christchurch and say, well, I don't agree with what he did, but um, you know, he must have been very provoked to have done something like that. That sort of sense in which the sense of acceptable policy options gets shifted to the right um, is, you know, frankly terrifying. And speaking just for the UK, we are, there is a real uh, reluctance, I think, certainly under the in current policy government circles to um, call a spade a spade, you know, uh, the murder of of, uh, of a MP during the Brexit campaign um, you know, was dismissed as not being terrorism. That's just kind of absurd. So, you know, I think we need to be just much more honest about that. Yeah. You know, so the final point really being that, you know, that extreme right violence is part of the Western political canon. We've, tended, we've had the luxury of forgetting that for a few decades, but its potential is there and it's coming back. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Um, anyone, else, anyone else, Jeps? I mean, maybe like in the US, obviously, you've been uh, going through uh, a few years also of uh, witnessing uh, probably uh, more research on uh, on these topics under uh, also a particular uh, administration uh, under Donald Trump. Uh, I guess so. You have probably been asking some of you some of these questions to to yourself or some of your colleagues. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we, we've got, um, you know, <laughs> we've got some issues to deal with, certainly in our in our uh, context. Um, it de definitely drives home um, the, um, you know, one of the ways in which we teach about terrorism to undergraduates and graduate students is the, the notion that it's a contextually oriented behavior, uh, terrorism, regardless of the ideology that's motivating or the grievances behind the behavior. Uh, it's a type of behavior that we see in multiple different kinds of contexts. Um, and by looking at it in that way, we start to realize that you have to have a contextually appropriate counterterrorism response. Um, and right now, I think uh, the U.S., at least I hope, again, as an optimist, that we're moving in the right direction. We now have a, uh, a national strategy for combating domestic violent extremism in the U.S. It's a first for the U.S. 
So, uh, you know, just like a, an alcoholic, you know, the first uh, step is recognizing that you have a problem. Uh, this is certainly something that's a, a good sign in the right direction here in the U.S. Um, the other uh, thing that I was uh, just kind of reflecting on in terms of um, the context in, in which uh, we've seen the, the increased uh, focus and attention and, and activities related to far-right extremism here in the U.S., um, I think we have to do a much better jo job in terms of holding politicians accountable um, you know, for again, like Tim said, not calling a spade a spade, uh, you know, refusing to acknowledge that, for example, in 2017, an attack against a mosque uh, was an act of terrorism. We had a particular uh, political leadership in our country that refused to acknowledge that as an act of terrorism, which, you know, most of us in the field would say, well, of course it is, you know, so I think uh, we have to hold our, our leaders accountable for those kind of mistakes. Yeah, thanks a lot, James. Um... Joe, we have a couple of questions that maybe are not explicitly directed to you, but I think you're uh, perhaps uh, that is your field of research um, that relate to women in terrorism. Um, and so I will bring those two questions together. And then if anyone else on the panel feel also um, they want to uh, answer that, please feel free. Um, but there is a question about what is motivating women uh, to join terrorism and what can be done to stop it. Um, but also the, there is another question, which I also think, think is quite interesting. Uh, basically, um, are there parallels or key differences in the way uh, basically women engage in terrorism in, uh, in the West uh, as opposed to in other regions in Africa, for instance? Yeah, thanks for the, the questions. And it's nice to know that there's a bit uh, more focus on this. I remember when I first started looking at the topic around 2013, I mean, I was asking about women that were going to join Islamic State. And, uh, you know, I would pose this question. Um, and I would pose it at conferences that generally get kind of laughed out, like, what, what roles do women have? Or why are you know, what are you even talking about women joining this? But um, you know, I think one thing that's uh, that's quite important to know is that the motivations for women to join groups are often very much the same as men's motivations to join groups. Um, but what that gendered analysis helps us better understand in, in terms of the motivations and the pathways and the, the circumstances under which they join um, violent extremist groups, um, it, it helps bring a much more nuanced uh, lens to it. So there's not one reason why women join these groups. There's not one pathway, but understanding how men and women uh, experience push and pull factors in relation to certain groups, um, the ideology they're adhering to and the kind of prescribed uh, roles for men and women within those. Um, I mean, women have played roles in terrorist groups throughout history. You know, you just have to look at the German Red Army faction where women were, were the leadership uh, of these groups too. So I, again, I think it's, it really emphasized that you really have to look at this on a contextual basis, um, including things like the regional norms in which uh, these men and women are joining these groups, the ideology that um, that these groups adhere to, um, and the the kind of personal, the very personal life circumstances under which individuals might join. You know, are they joining through family networks? Are they joining on a personal, individual basis? Um, are they joining because they feel there's no other uh, political recourse to address their grievances? Um, so I, I'm afraid it's not a very simple answer, but what I think is very useful uh, in terms of where we sit in the field currently is that that I think there's a much more open, uh, people are much more open, researchers are much more open to engage gendered analysis to help better describe and explain why men and women, boys and girls become associated with different types of political violence and how that can inform um, things like the rehabilitation and reintegration responses as well. Uh, and in terms of the comparative component, uh, there has been a lot of comparative work done. Uh, and so actually that's one of the, the points that we look at in the paper. So how much just looks at a single group and how much uh, looks comparatively at, at several groups. Um, but a lot of that tends to be quite descriptive as well. Um, so describing how roles uh, in different uh, groups might be similar for women. Um, but uh, so there is, it does exist, but I think there are limitations in how far um, that research has gone. And I think there's a lot of room for, for more exploration there as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe. And maybe I'll, uh, for a very last question, we have three minutes left, uh, but still we'll, we'll attempt that very dangerous exercise. Uh, and um, there's a couple of questions that um, gravitate around um, the same theme, uh, which has been touched upon by, by some of you. 
uh, in, in, in your first round of answers to my questions, um, which is basically that we might be entering uh, a new age of global power competition. And then basically a question is, uh, is terrorism becoming uh, uh, yesterday's uh, thing? So are we becoming, uh, you know, from the cool kids, are we becoming uh, uh, a bit of uh, the outcast? Uh, and, uh, and basically, does that also, what does that, I mean, how does that influence or field? Uh, and then Alex uh, Schmidt already mentioned, uh, indeed, um, state terrorism, state sponsored terrorism, are we going to, are we heading more in that direction again? Uh, have we never moved away from that direction? So just uh, anyone, uh, a few thoughts on, on, on that particular aspect uh, briefly, and then I think we will end uh, after, after that round. Since you mentioned my name, uh, I think the shift of uh, international political science attention uh, to state actors, to the competition China, USA, and the role of Russia, that does not mean that uh, terrorism goes on the back burner. We have seen it in the Cold War, there were proxy wars uh, fought in uh, developing countries, and uh, terrorism uh, and its plausible denial is an instrument used by state actors. And uh, in that sense, uh, terrorism studies will uh, not disappear because of the increased focus on big power uh, rivalry. Maybe the funding will go down for some terrorism institutes, uh, but the terrorism itself will uh, remain. Thanks a lot. Uh, Alex, Joe, you wanted to intervene as well? Yeah, I can maybe just add a quick point, but I think, you know, what the field of terrorism studies has really helped me reflect on is how we can better interact with and speak to adjacent fields. Um, so with the PREPARE project, I've been thinking so much, uh, we look at children involved in um, families uh, with links to violent extremism, and it's it's really highlighted for me how, whether it's um, children that grow up in cults or gangs or uh, trafficking, children exposed to war, there's so many other adjacent fields that we really haven't had a chance to have a, a real in-depth conversation with. And I think in a slower period like this, um, which is a great thing, it's great that we don't have attacks rolling across uh, Europe and North America and other areas in the world right now as we as we have uh, in the past. And I think it's a really op it's a real opportunity right now to consolidate knowledge um, in terms of what we have learned over the past decades. And also, again, really think about where we sit a little bit more in relation to adjacent fields as well, and how we can work a little bit more closely um, with those and take the knowledge that we have in our field and uh, and have a bit more of a conversation with, again, those, those partners and other uh, closely linked fields. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, unless anyone feels a burning urge to uh, add something in light of time, I suggest to uh, close here. Uh, and I would like to um, thank again uh, a lot uh, all the fellow panelists uh, and including uh, Alex Schmidt uh, for having uh, shared uh, your thoughts and knowledge uh, with us uh, today. I would like also to uh, welcome you all uh, as part of the new Perspectives on Terrorism uh, family. Uh, under the leadership of James Forrest as the new uh, editor-in-chief. We're very glad and also uh, still uh, under the close uh, watch and support uh, of Alex Schmidt as uh, co-editor. Uh, so we're looking forward to um, a new exciting adventure. So please, everyone, uh, visit uh, the new website of the journal, pt.icc.nl. Uh, subscribe uh, to make sure that you receive uh, every time uh, the latest uh, issue. Please uh, submit uh, your articles as well. Uh, there is a, a nice, uh, very loud uh, submit button uh, under submissions on uh, the website. Uh, we're welcoming uh, submissions from uh, young scholars as well as established scholars uh, from uh, any regions of the world on all topics related to uh, terrorism, counterterrorism, uh, violent extremism, and countering violent extremism. Uh, so please uh, share uh, your uh, manuscripts uh, with us. Also tell your colleagues to do the same. Uh, we would be more than happy to consider these for publications. As Alex mentioned, there's also uh, an announcement for uh, the PhD uh, award. 
so if you recently uh, defended your uh, PhD, uh, or if you know uh, someone uh, who defended uh, uh, his or her PhD recently, please uh, share that announcement uh, with them so that they can uh, be considered uh, for uh, the PhD uh, award. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone in the audience for attending, participating. Uh, we try to um, reflect your questions, so apologies for uh, those who asked questions that we didn't have time to uh, answer, uh, but it was great uh, to have you all with us for this discussion. Uh, and as a closing, I will simply share this thought with you. I realized yesterday that there is only a few letters difference between a webinar and a wine bar. I don't think this is really a coincidence, so you know where to find me next. Uh, and on this note, uh, thank you very much and looking forward to receive your uh, manuscripts uh, uh, in the near future. Everyone, thank you very much and have a nice 